Well, thank you very much for the introduction, the warm, uh, the warm welcome. It's, it's, it's terrific to be here in one of my absolutely f uh, favorite places to be in the world. And of course, being a, a, a Thompson Reuters director, it's always nice to be, nice, nice to be back in this building. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the origins of the study that I'm going to uh, talk about, which is, uh, which is a study that uh, the uh, Premier of Ontario, the, our governor equivalent, asked uh, myself and a fellow named Richard Florida, who's an urban geographer who's also at the Rotman School, an, an American who uh, joined the Rotman School a couple of years ago, asked us to uh, undertake this study of the long-term uh, future of Ontario, the changing composition of the economy and of the workforces the workforce of the economy and, and how that's going to influence Ontario going forward and to give, uh, give him recommendations on how to make sure we have a very prosperous uh, economy in the long term. Uh, and that was, that was last March and so we've been uh, working away at it ever since and what I will strive to do uh, today is something, we just released a report last week and uh, I think there were copies available. That's an Ontario based study where we compared Ontario to similar jurisdictions in the US. Uh, this, uh, for this uh, uh, talk tonight, what we've done is Canadianized everything and we'll make the uh, comparisons between Can Canada and the US uh, on a number of dimensions rather than, rather than Ontario. So I've, uh, uh, I've modified things a little bit. Three things I want to talk about, which is what's happening in this creative age and the, both the promise and the challenge what we have to do in Canada and what I would argue other jurisdictions need to do to take advantage of the promise and not fall prey to the challenges and what, uh, what the agenda is for, for uh, Ontario that we came up with. So one of the things that, that uh, I mean, I think people understand, but I'm not sure they understand entirely the magnitude of the change is that there's been this dramatic change in the composition of jobs in our economy. These are the Canadian numbers. The American numbers are quite similar to this, but I think if you would have actually told, uh, uh, told Canadians or Americans at the turn of uh, the 20th century uh, that there were only going to be 3% of people working in all the resource industries uh, combined, uh, they would have been fairly stunned given that at, at the turn of the 20th century, nearly half, 46% of the economy was in, engaged in that. So you can see that top block has gone from half the econo uh, economy to almost uh, nothing. Um, you can see that what we've, what we've uh, characterized three kinds of jobs as routine jobs, routine service, routine uh, um, physical, routine resource, as compared to creativity oriented uh, jobs. And this is an important distinction that we think we need to understand about the economy. The, what's, what is changing is the rise of creativity-oriented jobs, jobs that actually take lots of judgment and decision-making, that are autonomous uh, and require analytical and social intelligence skills of the sort that are not required in, in, in a vast proportion of uh, uh, the, uh, the other jobs in the economy, which are more routine. They're algorithmic. Uh, somebody gives, uh, gives the person in charge of the job the instructions and by and large they follow those, uh, those instructions. Think of it as, uh, as a routine physical job is the kind of job that we see in factories on an uh, on assembly line. A routine service job is uh, uh, payables or receivables uh, a clerk or a waiter or a waitress uh, following through a, uh, with not a whole lot of uh, autonomy. And what's, what's the good news about, about uh, the economy that's changing is that that absolutely dominated the economy a hundred years ago, right? Uh, if we look at all the occupations and we've categorized them into these, into these four buckets, uh, there were only 4% of the entire economy were those jobs in, uh, in Canada in uh, uh, 1901. And as of 2006, the last year we have uh, stats for this, that number is up to 29%. So that's the huge growth uh, in creativity oriented jobs and in fact, the number in America is a little, a little bit higher. It started at the same level and is at 36 uh, percent uh, in uh, uh, creativity oriented jobs. The other transformation that, that you can see that, is, that has happened is, is what's happened to physical oriented uh, uh, jobs, jobs that are typically in the manufacturing sector but, but can be in, in others as opposed to service oriented uh, jobs. Those service jobs have gone in Canada from 12% of the economy to 46% of the economy, while the r physically oriented jobs have gone from 38 to 22. So, quite, so almost a halving of, of, uh, of those jobs. 
And lots of people worry about the decline in manufacturing, and you'll hear stories about manufacturing jobs uh, declining. Uh, that is an inexorable decline, I would argue, in, uh, in developed economies. You would see a similar chart for all OECD countries. Top develop, uh, 30 developed countries in, in the world would all have this kind of, uh, of decline in, uh, in manufacturing-oriented uh, jobs. So what, uh, and, and, and the reason is not we're manufacturing less. So Canada is manufacturing more with 22% uh, with of the workforce in manufacturing-oriented jobs uh, than it was with 38%. Uh, with, uh, That's because productivity has grown, uh, grown so uh, quickly. Um, and what's happening in the future if we look forward, and estimates are made by folks who, uh, who, who, uh, who uh, study where, where the jobs are coming from, the picture is of a more creativity-oriented e economy uh, in the future. So of all the jobs that are going to be created in the next 10 years, uh, in Canada, 53% of them are going to be creativity-oriented jobs. And you can see very few jobs were cre uh, created in the routine physical uh, domain and uh, more in the routine service-oriented uh, domain. In the U.S., the numbers are lower for creativity-oriented, uh, uh, and that may be for two reasons. Uh, these, one is that two different uh, groups have, may have done these estimates, a group in Canada versus a group in the U.S., so I d I, I, you have to take them with a grain of salt. They may, they may uh, uh, the, the, as, far as, we, as far as we can tell, they're done in a similar fashion, but there may be differences. But the other thing, of course, is America has gone to service, to creativity-oriented jobs faster uh, than Canada and might be a reflection of the fact that they've moved, uh, moved more quickly on, on that front. But what it means is that this economy is going to get more creativity-oriented, both of our economies, going forward than now, because both of those numbers are considerably higher than, than uh, uh, the base. And uh, back to services versus, versus goods, if we just break the economy into services producing versus goods producing, as opposed to uh, occupations, which was the earlier uh, chart, you can see the dramatic, the dramatic shift. So from, for in 1946, from uh, Canada being 60% sur uh, goods, 40% services, to 77% goods and, or services and 23% uh, goods. And again, the American numbers are, are similar, it's 21%. Uh, is a similar number for goods for uh, America. And, and the only thing that's slightly different is America went a little bit qu uh, more qu uh, quickly. There was a, there was a quicker decline uh, in the 60s and 70s than there was in Canada uh, uh, for the goods uh, producing sector. So as, as I say, lots of people say, think services is bad because it's flipping uh, burgers at McDonald's. It is not. Service jobs are not not less less uh, less attractive than manufacturing jobs, and attempting to keep manufacturing big in the in the economy is something that uh, that that doesn't doesn't work and and, and won't uh, won't work. And much of it is classification oriented. So when a big company outsources its IT to uh, EDS or IBM Global Services, um, uh, and its thousand or five thousand. Uh, workers transfer over to EDS or IBM Global Services, they are treated as if they've moved from a manufacturing company to a service company. And we've lost manufacturing jobs when it's the same people doing exactly the same uh, uh, job. So the disaggregation of corporations has resulted in a more service intensive uh, economy. So what do we have to think about in, in, in terms of taking advantage of this shift to, to a more creative orient, uh, creativity-oriented economy, and what are the challenges and problems? A few things I'd, I'd say. So um, uh, we've done this sort of gruesome analysis of all the, uh, the major occupational classifications, 800 of them, and what kind of skills are required. You can break down the skills required for these various, uh, various occupations into these three buckets, analytical skills, social intelligence skills, and physical skills. And you can just see representative uh, occupations on, on that. So physical skills, firefighters are, are high, lawyers are, are, uh, are low, analytical skills, surgeons are high, and uh, pile drive operators are, uh, are low. And lo and behold, social intelligence skills of CEOs are, are uh, high. I, I would have never guessed, no. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, and and, uh, and there's some interesting things happening in, uh, happening uh, with respect to these these uh, these skills. Uh, 
So uh, one, one, of the, one of the questions is, does it matter, how much does it matter uh, if the occupation you're in, I involved in is, has a low requirement for analytical skills versus a high requirement for analytical skills? So if you're low on that versus high, let's say you're at the 25th percentile versus the 75th percentile, uh, that is consistent with an, uh, an increase in earnings, uh, per annual earnings of $15,200. So a fairly big ramp up for, for being in a job that has higher uh, analytical skills. And you'd think in the modern economy that those would be the most, most important and highest payoff skills, but they're not, and not actually even close. So in this new economy, it's the social intelligence skills that actually have the biggest uh, ramp up. So $25,000 uh, positive from, from uh, moving from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile uh, on, on that uh, uh, dimension, which I think is an interesting challenge, frankly, for the educational system because uh, the, school that's the, the school that I'm involved in would spend most of its time doing what, do you think? Increasing analytical skills, teaching an analytical tool, uh, tool uh, uh, set, even though, of course, uh, lots of the companies hiring will tell us it's, it's uh, people skills that are, that are important. And so the, actually the data now are, are, are convincingly uh, clear on that, uh, that question. Uh, and then physical skills, you can see the economy has gone away from, from physical skills. So if you are, uh, you are in, uh, go from a low physical skill requirement job to a high physical skill requirement job, you can expect that, uh, that your earnings uh, uh, capacity will go down. Uh, uh, not, n not up. And so this is sort of a picture of the, of the creative economy, uh, which is a, a, an economy that rewards analytical and social intelligence skills, social intelligence skills more, and physical skills uh, uh, not at all. Now here are, here are the differences, some of the difference between the Canadian economy and the U.S. economy. Uh, interesting picture. So the U.S. economy is an economy uh, where both analytical skills and social intelligence skills and increases thereof are therein are rewarded significantly more highly than in Canada, and the punishment for for jobs that are uh, that that involve physical skills that are physical skill and intensive is greater. And this is a general generalized, I would argue, picture of the Canadian economy versus the U.S. economy. The Canadian economy is attenuated versus the U.S. economy. All the same things happen, but happen to a lesser extent, is the way, to, is, is, uh, is the way I've come, as I've studied for now, eight years, Canada versus the, the U.S. and all of these economic dimensions. That's, that's the, big, uh, the big difference. Now, there's some good things about that and some, some, uh, some uh, not so good things about that, and we're probably experiencing some of that now. The other, the other way to look at, uh, at, at industries, so thus far I've looked at uh, them in terms of the skills and the occupations. The other way to look at, at the economy is whether you're looking at an industry that is clustered or, or dispersed. And you can think of industries as having those two features. Clustered industries are industries where if you went across America and, and asked, and asked by, by postal code or by county, uh, do you have similar numbers of jobs in a given industry across all the counties in America, or do you have some counties that have a whole lot of uh, jobs in an industry and some counties that, that have very few? The, for, the, the, uh, the former are dispersed industries, where same in all, all counties, the, the latter are, con uh, are clustered industries. So if you ask movie making and ask, are they, is movie making spread uh, seamlessly across America? No, you'd find that there's employment in certain places and, and not others. If you, if you look at software, the same thing. If you, if you look at uh, aircraft uh, manufacture, uh, the same thing. Those industries are much more productive uh, and higher wage. Why? Because they can grow to great scale because they serve a region outside uh, their local region. Whereas dis uh, uh, dispersed industries like your local hair salon, uh, your local uh, gardener, uh, local TV stations, local newspapers, you find them uh, uh, everywhere across the, uh, the, the country. And it turns out that, the, as, as I'll show you, the wages are 
and productivity and innovation are much higher in those clustered industries. And you can see from this chart that, that uh, the, the creative, creativity-oriented jobs are much more plentiful and a bigger uh, piece of the puzzle in those clustered industries. And since the clustered industries are a little more manufacturing oriented, you see there's a bigger, bigger uh, chunk of uh, physical jobs in those in those industries as well. And if you if you uh, if you then ask the question, what's the payoff to being in a clustered industry? You can see it's quite huge. So if you work in an industry that's clustered, and again, if you work in New York and you're, you work in the publishing. Uh, business or the financial services business, although m lately maybe not so much, one of the industries that's highly clustered uh, here, that's the payoff. So that if you're in a routine o occupation, you make 38000 instead of uh, uh, 26000 And if you're in a creativity-oriented occupation, you make 83000 uh, instead of 65000 So the ramp up there is, is, uh, is quite substantial. The other thing, though, to start noticing, I think, is with the rise of the creative class, with the rise of creativity-oriented jobs, what you're seeing is a challenge to income distribution. So there's rising inequality in Canada and the United States equally, and a whole lot of that has to do with the rise of these creativity-oriented jobs that pay so much more uh, than the routine-oriented uh, jobs. And what we predict is that this is, going to, this is going to be a trend that is going to continue and become, become more market rather than less. Is that as jobs become creativity oriented and more of them, you're going to have a big class, if you will, of people in those jobs uh, who are earning high salaries and the routine oriented jobs are, are going to lag behind. And back to the attenuation argument. Uh, it's going to happen to a greater extent in America than, than Canada. So here is, uh, is uh, Canada versus, versus uh, the, uh, the U.S. In, uh, across these categories. So are you in a creativity-oriented job in a clustered industry? Uh, your earnings in Canada will be 64% higher than the average in, uh, employment income across the economy, 89% higher in, uh, in America. Uh, if you're in a, in a uh, routine-oriented uh, job in a, in a dispersed industry, you'll be at 29% lower in Canada, 38% lower in, in the U.S. And so you can see a picture there of income inequality just in spades, and it's in an exorable, right? It's occupationally driven because you've got that huge, uh, huge uh, difference, and again, those bars, the creativity-oriented bars, are growing and have grown from almost nothing to, to, uh, to uh, uh, 36 percent of the U.S. economy. They're going to get to be a bigger piece of the economy, and it's a greater, greater challenge for, for uh, uh, issues of income inequality and, uh, and social cohesion. And here's again the, uh, the, uh, the attenuation chart, <laughs> another attenuation chart. It's a bit of an eye chart. Uh, but. Um, what it is is the 41, there are, it turns out there are 41 clustered industries. You can look at the, all the clustered industries together. There are 41 uh, uh, of them uh, in the economy. And you can see in the vast majority of them, there's a higher component of the creative class, the creative creativity, intensive creativity-oriented jobs in the U.S. cluster versus the Canadian cluster, which is that these U.S. industries Right, whether they be aerospace or biopharma pharma or financial services, are more creativity intensive. They use creative employees to a greater extent than they're used in Canada, which results in higher productivity and higher wages uh, for, those, for those clusters. But, of course, then creates the challenge of if you're not in one of those clustered, clustered industries, and those clustered industries, by the way, uh, are, uh, have about 30% of employment. Dispersed industries have about 70%, clustered industries 30%. So you've got this crea creative class, creativity-oriented jobs 36%, clustered industries 30%, uh, routine jobs, dispersed industries around 70% 70, 70 of the economy, and you've got this 30-70 uh, split with huge, uh, huge income uh, uh, differences. Um, the three things, the three things that, that my colleague Richard, uh, Richard Florida talks about, talks about in terms of uh, what matters to economy are three things, tolerance, talent, and, and, uh, and technology. Uh, and 
tolerance is openness to new ideas and he uses as a prox proxy foreign born as a percentage of the population. And here Canada does extremely well uh, uh, versus the US, but in terms of talent, percentage of the population over 25 with a university degree, the US is, is considerably higher than, uh, than Canada. And, and, uh, and uh, a, big, a big problem in, uh, in Canada is we have a couple of the big provinces that have, have, uh, uh, have very small university sectors and that brings it down. If you're talking about my home province, Ontario, that, that, number, that number is 24, so uh, uh, a, uh, a closer number. And then patents, technology, uh, uh, America does a much better job on, on, uh, on, te on technology. Last, last, last uh, um, a chart associated with the difference again between creativity oriented and routine oriented occupations is this. This is unemployment over a long period of time. And what you can see is that if you are in a creativity oriented occupation, no matter how bad the economy gets, unemployment doesn't get over 4%. Right. Whereas if you're in a routine oriented occupation, unemployment never gets down to 4%, right? So not only are the wages dramatically lower in routine-oriented occupations, the unemployment is consistently way higher. So in the best of times, unemployment is about 3% higher than, than in creativity-oriented occupations. In the worst of time, it's 7 or 8% uh, uh, higher. Uh, so a, uh, a, a, real, uh, a real challenge. Um, the, the, uh, the other thing that, that, that I think is important to know, in this modern economy that's valuing analytical and social intelligence skills to a, to a, greater, uh, to a greater extent, um, the importance of early childhood development are, are ever more clear and, and, and manifest. And this is work by, by Richard Heckman, who's a Nobel laureate, on, on what's the payoff to education at various stages. And the payoff to education uh, at, in, zero, in zero to three uh, development uh, at, at that age uh, is, is uh, has massive payoff. And unfortunately, job uh, tr training post school, uh, post formal education has the lowest payoff. So one of the things in this modern economy that we have to you know, think very carefully about is, is making sure that we don't let people fall through the cracks uh, early because this economy, the economy that we're heading in, is going to punish them ever more economically. They'll be in occupations and industries uh, that do not provide to, uh, a particularly uh, a good future for them, low wages and high threat of being unemployed. So to get back to, to, to Ontario, what, what, we, uh, what we told the Premier uh, is that our agenda for the, for the creative age, which may bear some similar, uh, similarities to agendas for uh, for other jurisdictions has these four, four pieces to it. Um, one, we need to broaden our talent base. So, so currently of 18 to 24 year olds in, uh, in the province of Ontario, 40% of, uh, of them get post-secondary education, which is actually pretty good by, by international uh, and North American uh, standards. Uh, but it turns out that 70% of the jobs that are going to be created in the next 25 years are going to require post-secondary education, right? So think about it. We're putting out 40% who are going to compete for 70% of the jobs. What's going to happen to the wage rates in those jobs? They'll go up. And we've got 60% who are going to compete for 30% of the jobs. What's going to happen there? Wages are going to go down. And this, unfortunately, is a function, a, a, a situation that exists in, in, in all of the developed economies. All of the developed economies are educating their populace, their 18 to 24 year olds, to a lower extent than is required for the jobs that are coming. Right? And we're all worried. We're saying all these jobs are going to go to India and China or going to get co competition from India and China. Yeah, they for sure are when half or more of our kids do not get a stick of post-secondary education. So the dirty little secret of the North American economy. All the people in this room, right, are surrounded by people who have post-secondary education. That's not actually the situation writ large in this country or, or uh, my country. So one of, one of the challenges uh, we put to, to the Premier is to get participation rate up to 60% so that attainment gets up to 70%, with people going back to school and, uh, and immigration 
attainment, whether you have post-secondary education, is, uh, is about 10 points higher than participation rate of 18 to 24 year olds. So we've got to get, we've got to have a 50% increase from 40 to 60 in that over the next, in, in the next 30 years, or we will be making sure that we have, we have an underclass of underemployed uh, uh, kids who are now 18 to 24 and in 20 years are going to be 38 to 44 and will not ha will have a, if they're lucky, a low paying job that has high unemployment uh, uh, prospects. So that's broaden our talent, our, uh, our talent base. Harness the creative potential of Ontarians. Uh, it is very clear that the creativity content of jobs is directly related to their pay, the pay levels, and and the uh, and the employability, whether or not there's un unemployment. And what we think has got to happen is we have to take those routine-oriented jobs and make them more creativity-oriented. A big task, a big task. But as long as we make them algorithmic and routine, they are going to be competed away by low-cost jurisdictions. I mean, we can cry about that or do something about it. And I think the only way to do something about it is to one, broaden the talent base, and two, make sure that talent base is, 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 uh, is being uh, uh, used constructively. Establish new social safety uh, nets. We think the social safety nets that have been dis that created have been 20th century social safety nets. Welfare, uh, uh, you know, food stamps, et cetera. All, all of those sort of social safety net programs are going to be less and less effective in the 21st century. The biggest social safety net uh, we can provide is, is early childhood education, especially for disadvantaged uh, uh, kids, and then making sure uh, kids stay in school. So the dropout rates out of high school are scandalous across your country and, and, and uh, ours. Our province did a brave thing uh, a couple of years ago. They made it illegal to drop out of, uh, of high school. Hmm. Yeah, you, you either, you have, you have to stay in, in high school until you're 18 or an approved apprenticeship program, full stop. Used to be 16, it's now, it's now uh, uh, 18, which is, which is high school graduation rate. That is, that is a modern social safety net because if we let them drop out of high school, they, they have I mean, exceptional char characters who uh, drop out of high school will do okay, but the vast, vast majority of them will be poor for the rest of their life and, and have bouts, uh, long bouts of un uh, unemployment. Uh, so early child, better early childhood education, more, more thorough childhood education, and, and making sure that we keep, that we keep uh, people uh, uh, in school through high school so they have a chance of getting the post-secondary education that 70% of them will need uh, to get down jobs. And then, and then finally, uh, and this maybe is more of an Ontario thing, build province-wide geographic uh, advantage by investing and in linking up uh, uh, the province to a better extent. We don't have, uh, what's happening in, in, in the world is that all the economic activity of consequence is moving it to mega clusters, mega regions uh, that are building these, these spiky industries. I mean, Thomas Friedman wrote this wonderful book called The World is Flat. Uh, unfortunately, the world is doing exactly the opposite. Uh, it's absolutely crystal clear that the world is getting spikier, mm -hmm. uh, not not uh, not flatter. And if you have if you have towns that are not connected uh, to a big mega region, they're going to do badly, and there's few prospects uh, uh, for them. And so, and and that's that's uh, the case for Ontario. We haven't done a good job of of connecting them. High speed rail. Uh, uh, lower commuting uh, uh, time to get to to get to the uh, the heart of Ontario, which is which is uh, Toronto, and so that that fourth one I would say is a little more Ontario specific. But I would argue that that all jurisdictions in North America and elsewhere have to think about uh, the other three. So those are my thoughts from the from the uh, the study, and uh, I'd be happy to discuss it with Matthew or take questions. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Matthew Bishop. I'm uh, New York Bureau Chief of The Economist. And I think I've been asked to uh, kick off a discussion uh, with Roger, partly to bring some uh, English uh, impartiality to this <laughs> battle between Canada and, and the USA over who's got the better workforce and the better policies for creativity. Um, but also, I'm, f I'm fascinated by 
uh, this analysis. Um, and I guess what we're debating a lot about at the moment within The Economist is to what extent any of these trends that we've observed for the last 20 years are actually inevitable at all. And, and yep. you know, given the economic uh, world we're moving into, where perhaps America's going to become more like Canada in terms of heavy taxation and uh, a national health service and all that kind of thing, um, you know, is, is this whole um, trend of inequality, of, of, cre of, of creative people uh, getting more and more of the income uh, going to continue, or, or is that actually going to change dramatically now? I, I mean, I think it might get interrupted for, for, for a short period, but as I, as I look at the numbers and, and as my colleague Richard, Richard Florida uh, does, I, I would, you know, if I were a betting man, I, I'd, I'd bet that it will, it will ameliorate just like executive compensation did for about a year and a half after the dot-com <laughs> bust and then started heading, heading up, heading up a, uh, again. I, I, would, I, I would predict it will continue uh, uh, to, head, to head, uh, uh, head up towards more creativity-oriented uh, jobs, more spikiness, more, more challenge to, to people who do not live in a, in a mega region or, or work, in a, work in a clustered industry and creativity-oriented job. Let me push you a bit more on that. I mean, you yeah. said that the, the unemployment rate amongst the creative workers you know, never rose above four percent. I mean, I think certainly maybe it li maybe living in New York exaggerates that. But I mean, clearly the publishing industry and the financial services industry is in sort of massive layoff mode. Um, you know, I could certainly see the rate temporarily rising above four percent. I mean, do you think there's something about uh, what is it that makes you so confident that the rate stays low? Uh, yeah, I, I well, it, it is it is conceivable. That's that's only we only took that back uh, uh, for about twenty five years, and it's conceivable that the unemployment rate will get worse than it did in nineteen uh, ninety two ninety three, and so maybe it, it it may it may go higher. But but my 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 prediction is is that when we when we look back at this period, however long this downturn is, is, go is going to be, and look at the unemployment rates, there'll be this uh, huge differential, and I bet the differential between, between unemployment in routine versus creativity oriented will be six to eight points. Now maybe if it's bad enough and down enough, the uh, creativity oriented will, will be five or six percent or something, but I, I, think, I think the, the, the differential uh, will be there. Because again, remember, uh, in financial services, there are creativity-oriented job classifications and routine-oriented job classifications. And I bet my bottom dollar that, that there's as many people being laid off in the routine-oriented as there are in the creativity-oriented, uh, even, in, even in that sector. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, if you do get a massive slowdown that has now seems increasingly likely, um, and unemployment rising to say 10 or 11 percent for the the, po the the population as a whole, and that a lot of those jobs are certainly going to come out of the service sector by definition because of it's so big, yeah. because it's so big. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's a sort of sense in which people who are creative are not necessarily going to be able just to switch into the routine service jobs. They'll seem overqualified and so yes. forth. And so I, I I suppose my my worry would be that you know that actually this is the first time you do see the creative class really suffer. Um, and I wonder, you know, in terms of stimulus packages and things of that kind, we've no experience of using stimulus money to either push service jobs in general or indeed the creative class into work. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that. Yeah, well, um, I mean, the, the, I guess my reading of the history of stimulus packages is they mainly kind of stimulate after the economy has fixed itself. So I, I'm not holding my breath waiting for this stimulus package or our stimulus package to, to kind of do the trick. Um, um, but I do think, I, I, I still think, and this is one of the things that we, we argue in this report, we're still far too much uh, oriented towards saving manufacturing jobs. And I think, uh, uh, and now everybody, everybody writes me uh, emails telling me that I'm, you know, I shouldn't be so anti-manufacturing. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm just the the it is mythology that manufacturing jobs are better, and they're the and somehow we're we're we can't all be work in services. Again, over the last 50 years in America, manufacturing output has gone up seven times, seven times, and uh, manufacturing employment has gone down by a half. So we're not not making stuff. We're we're just making stuff really efficiently. And you know, if you'd have told anybody at the turn of the century in America, you know, guess what? There are only going to be two percent of people working in agriculture. Everybody would have said, "Oh my God, we'll be we'll be importing all of our food, right? A hundred percent of our food. I mean, it, this this will be a disaster, and and we'll be we'll be vulnerable uh, to people cutting off our food supply. But we're America's a major exporter of of agricultural uh, products. Um, so I think I mean that's a little bit of a sidelight, but I think in stimulus packages uh, of the sort we have, there's more of a focus on saving a kind of jobs that isn't more important to the economy than than uh, uh, than a whole lot of uh, uh, higher end service service jobs, and that and that I guess I, I worry somewhat of, somewhat about. Um, but I, I just, I'm, <laughs> who knows? I guess if our, if our, if, if, I, if I got a get out of jail card uh, that says you can spend as much as you want now, I guess maybe I'd do that too. But $800 billion seems like a lot. So, yeah, it is a lot. Um, <laughs> the, Last time I checked. Yeah. Um, the car industry obviously is one of those industries that clusters uh, and actually spans you know, the border. Um, and how? I mean, how do you? How how does Canada view the bailout debate for the car industry? And how do you think about? Because obviously there are, as you say, some very creative workers in the car industry. Um, and how how does that all play out as a strategy? Well, it it, it is of great interest, uh, not so much to Canada as a whole as to Ontario, because those jobs are so focused in Ontario. There used to be more of them in Quebec. There's fewer of them in Quebec now. So it's of, of huge interest to uh, Ontario. And since Ontario is 40% of the Canadian economy, it is then of interest to, to folks in Ottawa. So there was pretty much in Canada an immediate response that if they do the bailout, we'll do our, our part. Uh, and that has, in fact, happened. There's equivalent <coughs> bailouts money being provided in, in Canada under similar <coughs> Relatively similar arrangements, uh, and uh, you know, it, it it certainly would be, it it would uh, be really painful for the Ontario economy if the, the the car companies went down. Although Ontario has been the beneficiary of a number of uh, uh, Asian import plants, so big Honda, big Toyota, uh, Hyundai. Um, uh, so Ontario, in that respect, is more like the U.S. Uh, a right to work south southern states w that have gotten the the um, the Japanese and, and Korean plans, so that would ameliorate it a little bit. I'm going to throw it over to questions in a moment, but um, I, uh, two other questions from me. One, um, you know, how much is the fact that you have more of the creative workers in a particular industry compared in America compared to Canada, due to the different tax policies? Between the two countries, the fact that it's, you're able to you know, get richer and pay less tax in America than in Canada. The, inter the, the interesting um, thing for me uh, on that front is that is that the the tax. I, so I, I I don't think I don't think it's personal tax rates. Uh, I used to, uh, and then I actually analyzed it and then looked at the numbers, and it just the the major locuses of the creative class in America are in states where the differential in personal marginal income personal income taxation uh, when you add up states and 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 federal just isn't very different so I don't think that you have a creative class impact of, of a five or six percent difference in marginal tax rates uh, in in Ontario versus New York Ontario versus California Ontario versus Versus uh, Illinois, Ontario versus Massachusetts. Um, so, so I, I used to think that, that that there was a real brain drain problem 
uh, between Canada and the U.S. that was based on, on tax, tax rates. But you, when you look and ask how much money are you actually talking about, the answer is, is not, not much. What the big problem is, is that I think the U.S. economy has tuned itself. Uh, it's at an equilibrium that uses a higher um, level of, of resource. So there are way more people with graduate degrees per, 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 per capita in the U.S. than Canada, about 2x. Uh, and that's because industry utilizes them. And so what, what you see is that the, the big difference between Canada and the U.S is not in after-tax, the, the difference between pre-tax and after-tax income, it's all in the difference between pre-tax uh, income, and that's a function of the U.S. economy using skilled labor more intensively and getting more out of it than, than they get out of Canada. Um, and I think, I think that has to do a lot with, with, with uh, the worst mistake Canada made economically in its history, which is in 1878, it decided that you people were nasty and that unless we protected our industries, uh, they were going to be overrun by Americans. And so we were going to protect our infant industries. And we declared them to be infant for 111 years. <laughs> and we got used to not innovating uh, and, and instead watching what went on in, in, in America and then doing whatever they did in Canada. And it doesn't take as highly skilled people if you're just watching what they do and then replicating it. Behind a behind a massive tariff wall, and so that's more. I, I've come to believe that it's not marginal effective tax rates on personal income. It is it is uh, it is uh, a, a history of industrial organization that caused us to use talent less intensively, and we've got to work on using talent more intensively and asking for a greater amount of talent in our in our businesses to get our, our wages and productivity and innovation up to the level it is in the US. You're not more high tech oriented. You know, if you add up, so here's a, a quiz, a little quiz. Mm -hmm. add no, you're up, not asking me. That's no, okay. I'm asking all them people. It says yes. Add up the following sectors of the US economy. Uh, computer, hardware, and software. Telecommuni telecommunications, hardware, and software. Biotech, pharma, pharma and biotech, medical devices, aerospace vehicles and aerospace engines, right? I've added up all of high tech together. What percentage of your jobs in the American economy are in those sectors? Any guesses? Seven? Five. Five, 12, yeah. People would generally guess, guess uh, between seven and, and, and 20%. It's 1.76. In Canada, it is lower. It's 1.64. So if we had as many high-tech jobs as America had, we'd have 3,500 more jobs in all of Canada. Uh, so we're not less tech-oriented tech than, than the US. We do the same things that the American economy does, but we do them tuned to a lower level of use of of, of talent and at a lower level of innovation. So I'm, I'm tempted, having sort of watched all the news coverage of um, America's CEOs grabbing bonuses in Wall Street and flying to Washington from Detroit to beg for federal bailouts and so forth, mm -hmm. to wonder how you define social intelligence if, uh, <laughs> um, if they well, come top of the list. That's what I, that's what I said. That's what and I what, what said. test you did that showed the difference between them and models in, yeah. terms, of, yeah. um, in terms of social intelligence. <laughs> but instead, I'm actually going to ask, I mean, my last question before I throw it over will be, um, you know, you, you've mapped out this competitive strategy for Ontario, but yeah. Who do you see as your competitors? I mean, is it really America now, or is it parts of America, or is it Europe, or is it Asia? I mean, what, what did you map out the different competitors and their strategies and so forth? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It, it, I mean, it kind of depends uh, on 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 how you uh, how you look at it. Uh, um, I mean, I, I do think that America, in many respects, is is a, is the most important competitor, partially because now eighty eight percent of our trade goes to uh, to America. Uh, and America is the richest jurisdiction of any consequential size on the on the face of the planet, um, and and so I think there are lessons to be learned from uh, from that. There are only um, 
three jurisdictions of any consequential size outside of America that are any uh, uh, higher in prosperity than Ontario. The little region around Munich, the little region around uh, uh, Frankfurt, uh, and uh, the little region around uh, uh, the uh, northern northern Italy, and only a couple thousand dollars in GDP higher. So I'm I tend to not I tend to say I'm not sure there's a whole lot to uh, to learn from them uh, about how a jurisdiction like Ontario should uh, uh, should do better. Now in terms of competition. There's, there's clearly, I think anybody who doesn't think about India and China now uh, and, and Brazil is probably you know, not being very intelligent, so thinking about competition in a different fashion, but it's, it's, it's more how can we be, I mean, how can we uh, accentuate and gain value from the differences uh, and a different strategy rather than what can we learn from the, the strategy uh, is more the question. But I'm interested in what can we learn from Massachusetts's education uh, a strategy, what can we learn from California, it's an innovation strategy, a bunch of those things are, what can we learn about Georgia and, and North Carolina, about pulling them, their economies up by their bootstraps, those are some of the things I'm, I, I'm probably most keenly interested in. Great, well let's throw it open to, to questions and comments, if you just say who you are, when, there should be a mic coming to you, there's a gentleman on the right. Yes, hello. My name is Nick Dahlheim. Um, I'm a, I'm thinking about uh, you know the inevitability of the move toward uh, creative jobs, and um, some of the realities. I mean, the United States, in particular, and Canada, a little bit less so, have relied heavily on our um, treasure of fossil fuels, which, according to the latest IEA reports, are actually in pretty severe trouble, and we're facing a major climate catastrophe. Should we be thinking more on the lines of what can we do to shore up ourselves locally in our local resource bases in a resource constrained future and how can we u utilize the physical labor that's going to be necessary to actually do that? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think it's one, it's one of the great challenges of the modern economy is to become less fossil fuel in, intensive really fast and so, I mean, I guess I think of it as a as a huge opportunity, uh, a huge uh, opportunity for lots of uh, cr creativity and creative talent being applied to the to the challenge. So I, I don't disagree. I think I think it's one of the great challenges of our of our era. And um, and uh, you know we can argue in, in in Canada we have vast fossil fuel resources, vast, 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 vast more than Saudi Arabia. Um, but if you go up there and look at what has to happen to get them out, it just, you're just left shaking your head, right? The amount of energy that has to go in, the amount of more water that has to go in to, to get a barrel of that, of that stuff, it just makes, I mean, it makes, uh, I look at it and say, nah, you know, it might be there, but I can't, I can't believe that that's good for us uh, long term. So, so I'm, I, uh, I'm inclined to say it's it's one of the great challenges, but I mean, I here's where I I I I'm forever the optimist. I mean, I I believe in in human creativity. Um, I mean, on that front, I'm, I may be being uh, overly interventionist, but I wish like heck when oil prices were up at 140, uh, we as, can, as, as Canadians or Americans Americans too would have just said, okay, uh, we're going to create a carbon tax that taxes oil uh, as if it's 150 a barrel. And the carbon tax is going to be the difference between the trading price of oil and 150. And so we would have a hundred and whatever, $10 carbon tax per barrel. And we'd have utter consistency. So everybody who's investing in energy saving devices and alternative, alternative energy sources could just absolutely assume 150. It's just going to be one, I'm going to get paid off at a 150 rate essentially for every, you know, for every gallon of oil I save. Uh, because, because what's happened now is that everybody who was gearing up for alternative energy and alternative devices and whatever now says, oh darn, oil prices are, are, are way down. And, and Business likes nothing better than a stable, a stable environment for investment. And so I kind of wish now it would be suicidal.
for people to do, to do that because we're de uh, for politicians to do that. I don't think it would have been suicidal uh, when when uh, oil prices were as high and we kind of blew an opportunity. Okay. Um, from the My name is Bill Waitman. I'm with uh, the New Jersey State Government, Department of Labor, and I see tragedy every day yeah. uh, with loss of jobs, including some of those creative jobs. Uh, we have people from the financial sector uh, in northwestern New Jersey, uh, about 40 miles from here. But my question is, uh, uh, National Academy of Science reports in the United States have called for science, technology, engineering, and math in schools all the way, all the way up. Inner city kids fall off the map. They're not getting them. And we're not very competitive in those, uh, in those industries. How do you see us turning that around on a competitive stage? And by the way, New Jersey used to be the medicine chest of the world. Yep. And we've lost a great share of our, uh, of our uh, capability in that arena. Well, my beloved colleague Rich is from New Jersey. He grew up in, uh, as you may know, Richard Florida grew up in New Jersey and is fond of New Jersey. I mean, my. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit contrarian on STEM, science, tech, technology, uh, uh, engineering, math. Um, I, I mean, the way I, the way I see it, uh, uh, the trial lawyers have got the absolutely best lobby in, in Washington. Absolutely. They're, they're magic. Uh, and the second best lobby is the STEM lobby. Uh, and, and a whole bunch of the facts, facts that it throws around just aren't. I mean, I've done the analysis of, of, uh, of is there any correlation between prosperity or growth in prosperity across the world with uh, absolute numbers of uh, STEM graduates per year or percentage of your graduates that are in the STEM, uh, STEM disciplines? Or and there isn't. Um, and so it's, uh, and, and there's this whole argument that says we don't have enough and we'll be overwhelmed by, by uh, Chinese and, and Indian engineers. And there was going around for many, uh, for several years. Bill Gates was quoting it. George Bush was quoting it. Six hundred thousand engineers per year produced by China. Three hundred twenty-five thousand produced by India, and eighty-nine thousand produced by America. Uh, it turns out when you when and and a, and uh, you know a couple of Duke professors sort of said this. This Duke engineering professors said this. This doesn't sound right and kind of did this huge analysis to get to the bottom of it. And it turned out it all came from a fortune reporter who finally was willing to admit I just made him up. Uh, and, and, and it turns out the only way you get to 600,000 in China is by, by you know, including people who did a two-week course on, uh, on fixing uh, lawnmowers. Uh, so the, the, numbers, the numbers just don't, don't demonstrate to me that we are short of producing science and technology graduates. People say their, their, their numbers are shrinking. They're not, right? As stated as a fact, they're fewer than, they're, they're, they're not. Right? If you pick the right base year, and there's one base year you can pick, and one discipline, so computer engineering, and you pick the base year 2000, uh, you can get a decline. But that's it, right? That's the only way you can get a decline in any of these, any of these uh, uh, statistics. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, convinced it's the pan it's the uh, it's the panacea of the problem now that having been said that having been said I do believe that that having crummy science and math teaching in 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 schools that causes kids to, to drop out that would have otherwise gone through that that's not what we want and, I, and I'd, I'd care I'd care about that but but uh, the hysteria I mean I mean, look at who comes out with these programs. Gathering Storms, right? Gathering, that was the most ridiculous piece of work I've seen in a long time. A bunch of scientists saying science is really important. Yeah, duh. I mean, they're, they're going to say that. They, they, need to, they need some fact uh, 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 behind it. But I digress. So there's a lady, there's a lady over here on the, on the left. Yeah. No, there's a lady in front of you, sir. Oh, thanks. Okay. We'll come to you next. My name, is my name is Sharissa Fernandez. I'm with the After School Corporation. And I'm interested in uh, your views on education. You spoke about the importance of early childhood. But you also mentioned that um, the emphasis on education is not on the social intelligence skills. So I'm just curious what your recommendations are in that regard. 
Well, you know, th th I don't, I don't have. I don't have a whole lot yet because this is this is sort of like there's always whenever I do one of these you know, big studies where you where you study stuff that you don't know anything about yet, uh, stuff pops out and this was one of the ones that really popped out for me and it's got it's got me kind of all shaken up about what we teach, uh, and so I mean I I do think that we've got to ask the question what's what are the bodies of knowledge about social intelligence that we have to build. Uh, because you got to teach things that are, you know, I guess I'm thinking at the university level. Well, any level, you got to teach things that are that are rigorously understood, and and uh, you, uh, you can't just say be socially intelligent. You'd have to, you know, create curricula for it. But I am, I was just struck by going through our own program, and I'm very proud of our own program, our great MBA school, and everything. But I have to say, hmm, analysis, analysis, analysis. You know, uh, you know. It's, uh, it's weighted uh, dramatically in that direction. And, then, and again, that might be right. Maybe that's what we can do, and they get their social intelligence skills elsewhere. But I'm sort of thinking that if they're so darn important, can't we get organized on that front? So I mean, I, I wish I had lots more intelligence to say on it. But I'm just, uh, this is one of these where I'm just starting the rumination on what the heck does this, miss, this mean? And if, uh, if you got ideas on it from the, program that, the uh, programs that you're, you're running, I'm I'm, I can promise you I'm all ears. I mean, what for you is the defining question that you use to identify whether someone has social intelligence or not? Well, it, it, this, was, uh, uh, this was more, it was not so much identifying whether a person has it or not, it's what the, the requirements of jobs are. So we took the 800 jobs and it did this analysis. And, and, and the social intelligence skills are skills like, like creating teams, collaboration, uh, you know, getting people organized to, uh, to do things, as well as sort of the basic interpersonal, can you communicate with another person? And it's, a, and it's an array of skills that, are, that we call, and maybe social intelligence, that's just the name we hung on it, but it's that, that kind of mm. uh, a set of, uh, of skills. OK, a gentleman there. Thank you. Jeffrey Milton, a fellow of the association. As a uh, strategic advisor to GM, you probably had to expect a, a question like this, but there was a rather provocative headline in one of the Lunchtime's reports about, uh, if I can read it, if GM gets much smaller, will it be too big to f won't it be too big to fail anymore? And that, as a result, I think they announced 10,000 layoffs today. How can the big three respond to the, the challenge of the creative age, or is it just too late? Um. Yeah, so so you have to take everything I say with a with, uh, uh, with a grain of salt. I'm conflicted on this, as as the gentleman indicates. I I have for the last three years been working with General Motors to try and help them uh, uh, with their turnaround strategy. Um, I mean, I I the 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 auto the auto companies are an interesting blend of of and kind of past and future skills and, and skill sets and you know so if you look at the top 25 R&D companies in the world you'll see you know Ford you know Ford and GM on 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 that list and everybody say you got to be kidding me it, it shouldn't it just be kind of you know HP and IBM and and, and a bunch of tech companies no it's it's uh, uh, those and and uh, Daimler uh, and maybe even BMW might be on I forget but uh, um, it is an industry that that does an enormous amount of R and D and has enormous creative creative uh, creativity oriented occupations in it, so it would be a shame to to lose it from uh, uh, from that uh, sense. Um, what I mean, why I think I, I think GM has got a shot at at uh, at making it through. It's not no by by no means a sure thing, but I think it's got a shot. And one of the reasons is is because it's because it's got. The most enviable footprint uh, in the world outside American Japan. So, if you exclude American Japan and say who's got the best kind of position in the market, otherwise it's it's General Motors, uh, and they are you know uh, in uh, depending on how you count it, either eight or nine of the, t the ten top markets in the world are number one in market share. America is is a is a disaster uh, f uh, for them that takes and will take an enormous amount of. Of, of fixing for a, a whole bunch of historical reasons that mainly have to do with the relation, the way they forged a relationship or lack thereof with the United Auto Workers, uh, and what they gave away uh, in various rounds to avoid avoid bigger fights than they otherwise had. 
But I, 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 think, I think what, uh, what I've been arguing uh, in Detroit is, uh, is uh, getting much more precise about how they target vehicles for markets uh, and make every vehicle a very purposeful vehicle rather than just another vehicle. And if they do that, uh, they have successful vehicles. And if you look at the, the last series of launches, they've been, they've, they've been successful. They just have to do that all the time across, uh, across the board. I have a hard time, in truth, seeing, seeing uh, how the Chrysler that was left over after, after Daimler is positioned to survive because it's got a North American-only footprint and and truck and minivan uh, centric. That's that's a tough that's a that's a toughie. And Ford is somewhere uh, in between, with not as good a global footprint, but a better financial situation and a CEO who seems to be doing a, a good job uh, getting big important uh, uh, vehicles that people like. Out. So um, I have you know I said before I'm an unabashed optimist, and so I dive in on anything, and I'm optimistic, and I think there's a there is a shot, but it ain't. Ain't gonna be easy. I think we had one more question. Um, to have one more question, gentlemen in the middle there. Yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Steve Brandt, and I work in international development uh, with the UN Global Compact, Corporate mm -hmm. Social Responsibility. I'd like to ask you about the World Economic Forum at Davos, and the Economist had an essay called "Mountain Reboot," which uh, claimed that. The challenge we face is that the global economic system is like a crashed computer. And um, I wrote an essay in response to that on the Huffington Post called Mountain Redesign, because I think we need the economic system to be designed for a world that's interdependent and sustainability-based rather than Darwinian com competition and uh, constant consumption-based. So I'd like your thoughts on whether we are faced with a crashed computer or are we in a car that's actually on the ocean and we really need to be in a boat? <laughs> I, th I think that's too hard uh, <laughs> question. Um, I mean, this gentleman uh, has, has many views on corporate social responsibility too. Um, but I, so I'll, I'll say a few things and, and you should, you should uh, respond. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I wrote a book recently about about uh, 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 often trying to look past the either or choices, and I and that's what I'd say on that one. It's not not so much an either or choice. I think there's uh, I think there's a you know kind of a uh, a bit of both. I don't think we want to lose the the wonderful wonderful uh, aspect of competition, the uh, that that uh, the wonderful aspect that competition brings. Uh, but I think uh, we also need a greater sense of of uh, of social responsibility. Um, I mean, the thing to think about competition is competition is the best training companies can get. Companies do badly when they aren't trained by competition. The big three had trouble because they weren't sufficiently trained by competition for long enough when they had an olig oligopoly. Public utilities have, have real problems because they don't get trained by competition. So I like uh, competition. Um, but as for corporate Social responsibility. I, I guess I see a couple things. One is one is consumers have to lead, right? And and you know one of the other things I I did in my in my old life is I consulted uh, and I still do consult to Procter and Gamble, and I was involved with something about 15 years ago where they decided to get kind of really get on packaging aggressively, and they created they created these the uh, for Liquid Tide they created these thin film. Re replacement. So you bought the bottle of Liquid Tide the first time, and after that you did these this the, these really and they did they did great engineering on them. They were thin film uh, packets. You had to snip the corner and pour it into your other uh, other other bottle, and it had one tenth the footprint. And they did a whole bunch of other other things, um, but that that that's exemplifying it. What happened? Consumers would not go to the irritating length of actually snipping the corner off something and pouring it into something else. Right? And 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 they had to actually, you know, and they actually had to sell them all at a discount off the shelf to get rid of it and and you know, and if you and if you then said to anybody at Procter and Gamble for the next ten years, we really gotta get on get on packaging because that's really important to the world, they'd say, Yeah, but consumers aren't there. So uh, consumers are there now, I think. Right uh, to to much a much greater extent, and I think consumers will drive 
uh, a greater level of, of, of sustainability. But unless they play, unless they drive, it isn't, it, it's never happened and it won't happen going forward. That having been said, I think a bunch of corporations uh, can, uh, can do more uh, leading. And I wrote an article on this, if, if you're interested, called The Virtue Matrix, uh, uh, a number of, of years ago, say, which argued that I don't think we have uh, good enough models for corporations that think intelligently about social uh, responsibility. And so I think, in part, the theories about how to think about it have to develop. Corporations have to be more aggressive in, in following, and consumers have to keep pushing uh, harder because consumers can get whatever they damn well please, right? That is the argument. I mean, they do. And but if they're ambivalent, right? Scandinavian consumers for a long time have been willing to blow their noses in brown tissues because they realize they realize that that the worst part of making paper products is that final little stage of bleaching. And it's the most environmental degradation comes from that one thing. And they'd say, you know what? Toilet paper, facial tissues, baby diapers, they can be brown. They'll be OK. North American customers, consumers, no way. Right? And so we have a huge, have a huge difference. Consumers, consumers, consumers can drive uh, uh, all of this. <laughs> you know more about this. Well, thank you. I, mean, I, I, did, I, I will take my opportunity to plug my own book. Yeah. Um, the, I, I've just written a book called Philanthropic Capitalism, yep. which is actually making the case for what the social contract should be between business and the rich and the rest of society. Um, and there's actually, I've just written a piece on Huffington Post about the discussion of that that took place at the World Economic Forum. And I actually did write the Mountain Reboot piece as well, that you, an anonymously in The Economist. Um, just very I, brief, I wondered. Just very briefly, I mean, I, I, I think that um, it was interesting at the World Economic Forum how many people um, you know, were looking for something optimistic to take out of what was quite a depressed, you know, and rightly depressed uh, gathering. Um, and a lot of the optimism came from this is actually a chance to, to sort of rebuild a, site, a, a business and, and, and in fact social entrepreneurship on, on a more sustainable basis where you know, I think both um, you know, a lot of green policies were being talked about, but also I think there was at least in some parts a discussion of the ethical failures that had taken place and whether the, certainly short-termism had been a massive uh, folly and a cause of many of the problems. Now, that may have just been the conversation that took place because the climate was so grim at the moment in the world economy. But I think that I, fe I felt that at least some of that was you know, sincerely meant and, and that people were trying to think through how they could take that away and actually put it into practice. But I guess that will remain to be seen. That's, that's, I'll be optimistic like you and yeah. assume that, that some of that will change because I think people saw their own, I mean, a lot of people have obviously been shaken up in business by uh, what's gone on and how many people who thought they were running a sustainable business have found that they were you know, facing extinction because of uh, things that were beyond their control and where people were behaving in a very short-termist way, particularly in the financial markets. So I think they don't want to be exposed to those risks and those short-term pressures again. No, I would agree. But anyway, on that, um, on that, I feel bad taking the last word. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I, I thought it was very appropriate. Okay, well, on that note, I'd like to thank you very much <laughs> for being uh, very, very fascinating. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.